Hello, everybody. It's Mike. Hope you're doing well. A couple of quick announcements I wanted to make before we get started. What you're about to hear is part two of my interview with Chris Davis about the last time I saw her face. Uh, we started that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, second is that in two weeks from when this episode comes out, you'll be hearing my episode with Glenn Nelson, where we'll be talking about covers of Lightfoot songs. So that's what's coming up, and it's great to begin season three with you. Okay, here we go. The first guest of the evening is truly a poet. He's an artist. He is a friend and an inspiration to anyone who I think who has ever played the guitar uh, or tried to write poetry. Would you please welcome Gordon Lightfoot? <laughs> We've talked about Lightfoot covering Christofferson in our conversation today, and we'll talk in a few minutes about the people who have recorded this other than Lightfoot, and I want to hear your take on those. But let's talk a little bit about the, the context in which the song was released. It was on the Did She Mention My Name album. It came out in 1968. It was the second song on the LP on side A. I think the first one was Wherefore and Why. The song was not released as a single, which I can kind of see because it's a little long for a single, although it's beautiful. The album went to number 21 in Canada, and the information I have indicates that it didn't chart in Australia, New Zealand, the US, or the UK, but it is still fairly early in Lightfoot's career, so he's still seen kind of as a regional artist at this point. Chris, what is your favorite musical aspect of the song? There are a couple. First off is, if we're not talking about the way the vocals are performed, and we're just talking about the actual music instrumentation, I think the guitar leads, if you listen to this version of it, the guitar leads are more harmonic parts, meaning he's playing more harmony than melody. Red Shea is, along with it, it's some of Red's more sensitive work. and also the swelling strings and that's why the guitar kind of takes maybe a little bit more of a back seat in the middle of the song because the string arrangement is so thick it's an embellishment of the song and i think maybe they were planning for that in considering what the guitar should sound like i really think it's kind of a unique lightfoot work in that aspect because the way they usually work when they did these albums were the three-person band played their parts, and then the string arranger came and figured out string parts to overlay after they were done. It just sounds to me, and I don't know this, but it sounds to me like they may have been thinking about what the strings were going to sound like in the song when they laid down the guitar parts. And also, Gordon plays on this song essentially what is a lead part to begin with. The opening introductory notes are essentially a lead part. Gordon didn't play lead guitar very much, but he did on a few songs. If you listen to If Children Had Wings, he and Terry trade leads to begin with. That's not all just rhythm part. They are actually trading some leads, and they did it in concert too. This is just one of those few songs where Gordon actually uh, played melodic parts on the guitar rather than just rhythm. It's a really good point that Lightfoot, we think of him as being front and center on rhythm guitar, but we don't think about his own skill with it in doing something other than the accompaniment. That's one of the two things that I loved the most about it myself. The strings on that were just perfect. I don't think we would use that kind of orchestration too much in modern music. And in that sense, it was very much a product of the late 60s and the early 70s. But the strings did come in at just the right time, and they were at just the right volume to communicate the depth of the emotions that we hear in the song and in his vocal, which we've already talked about, was certainly infused with a lot of emotion. And then the other thing that I thought of, you mentioned the very first notes, and I am would be willing to bet that it is a dead ringer for Joni Mitchell's recording of Urge for Going that was on her Hits album. It's almost exactly the same notes. It's almost exactly the same picking pattern. 
and it is one of only two or three songs that Joni ever wrote in standard tuning. And I'm not trying to suggest at all that Gordon was copying anything from Joni, although they probably knew each other and liked each other and respected each other. But when I first heard the song, I thought, okay, that sounds familiar. So let's talk a little bit about the people who played on this. And this is something, Chris, that you and I had talked about before we went on the air today, that you wanted to talk about the instrumentation and the people who played on this. We've talked about Red Shea, who was playing lead acoustic guitar and was playing, as you said, harmonic parts. John Stockfish was still with Lightfoot. He wasn't going to be there for a whole lot longer, but he was still playing bass, and I thought he did that very tastefully. But John Simon was the producer of this record, and he was responsible for the string arrangements. And I've said in other contexts the kinds of things that John Simon went on to do as a producer and as an arranger. So I wanted to know, did you have any particular observations about the personnel that played on this particular song? There are other people who are credited for the record, but those are the people that we know played on the last time I saw her. Yeah, the thing about John Simon is he was an uh, excellent instrumentalist himself. So he not only produced... And this was actually around the same time, maybe even a little bit before this, but he produced the band, kind of like a sixth member of the band. Sometimes he played horn instruments on their records. So the guy understood music, he understood accompaniment, and he understood production. And I think it really came out here in the choice of having a strings-only orchestra, meaning there wasn't anything in there that might have made this sound cheesy. If you go back and listen to some of the arrangements on covers of, say, If You Could Read My Mind, sometimes people put flutes in there or some woodwinds or maybe occasionally a horn, and it would just cheese it up just enough to where it would make the hardcore Lightfoot fans say, yee, and cringe a little bit. None of that here. The, the accompaniment is exactly what a Lightfoot tune would need. It was the the epitome. And you mentioned John Simon. He's still around. I think he's operating out of Connecticut now. He did work on music from Big Pink. He worked on The Last Waltz. He worked with Big Brother and the Holding Company. And I think he may have worked with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And being a horn player, you know, that would also have been into his bailiwick. You talked a little while ago, Chris, about seeing Lightfoot play this in concert, and I think you said that you saw him play it in 1974. He played this song 30 times in concert, from what I could find. The first time was probably while he was still promoting the Did She Mention My Name record, because he played it in October of 1968, the same year this album came out, at the Queen Elizabeth Theater in Vancouver. The last time he played it was almost exactly 50 years later. He played it in September of 2018 at the Holland Performing Arts Center in Omaha, Nebraska. So he missed it by about a month, but the, from first to last, it's almost exactly 50 years, which I thought was kind of a fun fact. We'll be right back to our conversation with Chris Davis about the last time I saw her. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. Welcome to Books Boys. Every month, the Dean and PJ tell you all about the books they've been reading and make some recommendations from our old favorites, plus surprise call-ins from authors to talk about the works that they're writing, original music, prize giveaways, and more. That's Books Boys on BooksBoys.com and all good podcatchers. Books Boys. Get it. Buy it. Books. Do you like classic albums? Technically, like, you know, the 20th century albums, um, such as, like, Beatles, Led Zeppelin, <laughs> Rolling Stones. I've only had Beatle episodes so far, however, I'll be doing more. But, 
welcome to my show, or rather, hey, welcome to check out my show. <laughs> um, all those years ago, a classic album podcast with the dipping sauce. Um, as you can see, the here <laughs> George Harrison reference. Um, I review classic albums. Um, not of those the likes of Beethoven, the likes of the Beatles and Rolling Stones, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, or what have you. <laughs> um, so yeah, check it out. It's every Monday. Um, I do albums, conspiracies, songs, all that jazz. So just check it out. All those years ago, a classic album podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> You talked about covers. Well, there have been a few people who have covered this. John Arpin, Harry Belafonte, Glenn Campbell, which is uh, the one that I think is best known. Keir Dulea, Jerry Candiston, who's been on the show. Johnny Mathis, Telly Savalas, and Andy Williams. And I had a question I wanted to ask you. Well, two questions, really. One is that do you have any thoughts on any of the cover versions that you've heard? And second... Do you have any reaction to hearing that Elvis had wanted to record this song but never got around to it? Well, for the Elvis question, you know, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, Elvis had a lot of songs that he wanted to record and just didn't have the time because Elvis was a connoisseur and a student of pop music. He loved it. He could play a lot of the Beatles tunes. He could play some of the licks, you know, note for note on the guitar and the bass. Elvis doesn't get a lot of credit for being much of a guitarist, but when he was at the house, he studied these records. Paul McCartney was the one who attested to that. He said that Elvis actually picked up a bass and went through, I can't remember which number it was, but he went through one of the Beatles singles note for note on the bass. So the guy studied records. He loved music beyond the drama. That was his forte. As far as the covers go, I have heard. Glenn Campbell. I heard that back in the 90s, even though he recorded an entire album called The Last Time I Saw Her, and If You Could Read My Mind was also a cover on that. But the album had a very 60s sound, even though it was done in the early 70s. And his cover of The Last Time I Saw Her is actually, it's a very good, a very solid cover. Telly Savalas, I mean, it's kind of hard to listen to a cover of a Lightfoot tune where you're thinking about a guy with a uh, dum-dum in his mouth going, who loves you, baby? Who loves you, baby? Yeah, Kojak. Uh, <laughs> Harry Belafonte. I don't think I've heard that version, but now I've got to go look it up. You were talking to about the live performances, and I was kind of surprised to see that 2018 date in there because it seemed to me that Lightfoot stopped performing the song pretty much altogether in the early 90s when it became a bit too much of a vocal reach. He had mentioned at one time that his voice dropped a couple of keys between the early and late 90s. And you can hear it if you listen to oh, yeah. concert recordings. You can hear the difference in his voice at that time. He's somebody who loves cigarettes, never stopped smoking until the very last years. It just kind of surprised me that I saw you know that uh, 2018 date on there because... The 93 recording that I heard of it actually was not bad. It was not that strained, but you could tell that it was the time when he stopped singing some of the high notes on Canadian Railroad Trilogy and started substituting lower notes, doing that on several songs. And I remember reading a concert review one time where somebody had called out the last time I saw her and he played the opening notes and started to sing it and then stopped just kind of said, ah, can't do that anymore. And he even admitted in the late 90s that he was not as agile on guitar anymore. You know, they kind of got into a um, what some older performers do when they get into kind of a scripted performance. He got into that a little bit and stopped improvising as much or taking requests very much. They just did what they did after a certain date. And can't blame him. He was slowing up. If he was writing songs, he wasn't necessarily performing them all that often. And that particular key that it's written in, I mean, the chord shapes are in the key of A. I know he used a capo, so I don't know what key he was actually playing it in. But he may have tried to drop it down from that because the Gordon Lightfoot of the 2000s and the 2010s was certainly not the Gordon Lightfoot of 1968 in terms of vocal prowess. 
I think that's one of his failings is that he did not like dropping things. He did not like dropping keys and he would always try to perform the songs in their original key. And I, I love that about him, but I also hate that because I think that took some songs out of the repertoire that could have been, if he had, for instance, dropped Canadian railroad trilogy, just a half step, it may have been something that he could have performed more often in the later years, but he was, quite stubborn and that's fine he's a human being they had their arrangements mike was uh playing the keyboard you got this kind of an obligation as a guitar player to the keyboardist <laughs> and oh, yeah. they have an obligation to each other so they weren't uh, they weren't all about rearranging songs you know they were his songs i mean as far as i'm concerned you can do whatever he wants with them the fact that he was trying to stay true to their original keys it's admirable, but I also think that he probably could have realized that he just couldn't hit the notes anymore. And so rather than try to make the adjustment, I guess he just cut some songs out completely. You mentioned Canadian Ra Railroad Trilogy and this one also. We'll be right back to our conversation with Chris Davis about the last time I saw her. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. American West, a place where our character as a nation took shape, where dreams came true, where ambitions were shattered, and where legends were born. But above all, a place where ordinary people came looking for a new life and ended up doing extraordinary things. No one tells the story of the Old West better than author Rick Steber, and now there's a podcast dedicated to his stories and poems. It's called Writing the West, and in every 15-minute episode, you'll hear the stuff most history books left out, but that we can't afford to forget. If you want to hear the real stories of real people in the Old West brought to life, this is the podcast for you. Check it out on Spotify. That's Writing, W-R-I-T-I-N-G, The West, The Stories and Poetry of Rick Steber. Victorian Periodical Parade. Hey, this is our new podcast. We're going to make this podcast. It's going to be Victorian. It's going to be new. It's going to be us reading and then breaking it down in the same episode. Be excited. Listen to these horror stories that are actually going to be similar to your life today. This is the transition episode where we go from YouTube, Facebook into the podcast. This is what we're planning on doing. We have content already. Go ahead and watch, listen on YouTube and Facebook. Um, but now it's pretty much just audio only. So we're going to bring it to you in an audio format. And uh, here it is. We're going to nar narrate a book and then we're going to break it down into the things that you have learned about the Victorian era and then the, the crossover between the Victorian era, everyday life to the 21st century everyday life, right? Victorian Periodical Parade. Victorian Periodical Parade. Chris, as we're sort of winding down here, are there any closing thoughts you have on the song? And then I wanted to talk a little bit more about you personally. Well, I really enjoyed the song in every iteration I've ever heard it in. So I heard it, like I said, in that 74 version with just the three of them. I've heard that on the internet somewhere. Also heard it, 80s version, but the best version I think I've ever heard was from the Avery Fisher Hall concert in 1977. and instead of having a string arrangement, they had Pee Wee Charles with that clever pedal that was put together by Richard Harrison with a lot of sustain where they could make yeah. it sound like a string section. And it was absolutely gorgeous. It was note for note, perfect, word for word, perfect. And the ending that they worked out for the song was just as emotional as any of the verses. And hearing the audience respond to it just an incredible recording. But, you know, as it evolved, as the band evolved in the 90s, they brought in the keyboards a little bit. There was a version from the 80s where they actually had some keyboard in there. They had steel in it still. I think it was from 1985, so Pee Wee was still in the band. 
They had steel guitar, but then they brought in keyboards, and the keyboards weren't as evolved in 85. So it didn't sound exactly like strings. It sounded almost like horns. It was a very odd version of it. But then in the 90s, they toned it down a little bit, and uh, it still sounded good. Every time he performed the song, I think you were going to get a reaction from the people in the audience who bought Lightfoot Records, who, who loved his catalog beyond Sundown and Carefree Highway, because it was just such a powerful song. As you're saying that, I think about what if they had just done this on solo acoustic piano? Would it have had the same feel to it? I mean, you mentioned keyboards, but if they'd actually had a grand piano, what would that have done for it? And now, sadly, we won't ever know. Okay, Chris, you're the first person I've asked this question of, and I hope that you won't take it too personally. What were you doing And where were you when you found out that Gordon had passed? I was sitting on the couch watching TV with my wife. We had been in pretty much the exact same position when uh, about three weeks earlier, we had seen, I think my wife pointed it out first. She saw on a news release, she saw it somewhere that Gordon Lightfoot had canceled his tour dates. We saw Gordon for the last time uh, in May of 2022. We were living at that time in Indianapolis. We traveled to Nashville, Indiana, about an hour south, and saw that concert. I got to tell you, it was a weakened version. Sad enough to say that, but when Gordon broke his wrist, his guitar playing certainly was a, a whole lot different. It was present, but the arrangements, the band made up for a lot of it, but it certainly, they were different uh, arrangements than we had heard. It was a great show, but then when we saw him struggling to sing in Calgary on YouTube later that year, I actually remarked, I said, I don't think he's going out next year. He's 83 and he's got COPD. This is obviously a strain for him. So the night of May 1st, I have a good friend who keeps up with all this stuff with musicians and he texts me and it was just a, a little placard that some radio station had put out and it said, thanks for the music and had the dates. And I sat there and, you know, I just reached over and showed my wife and I didn't cry or anything. I don't know Gordon personally. He's not a family member or anything like that. I don't blame anybody for crying because he's a great artist. I just kind of sat there and I'm not even a stoic guy, but I didn't know how to react in all honesty because Gordon, his music and his personality. So much of my work ethic is kind of modeled after what I heard from him in interviews. So much of him has been with me for so many years that I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to react. I knew the moment would come in my lifetime, obviously, but I didn't know how I would react to it. And at that moment, I thought, what can I do to say something about his legacy? I still work part-time for the radio station in Indianapolis remotely. So I recorded a one minute tribute to Gordon to go on their 12 o'clock news program the next day. And that was a little bit therapeutic. Thank you for sharing that with us. And because you certainly reacted genuinely and you reacted in a way that made sense, given your line of work and your interests. I'll just say it now that for me, we were coming back, my wife and my son and I, we were coming back from some event, and I couldn't even tell you what it was, but we all came through the door and I pulled my phone out. I'd felt some buzzing and maybe I was driving and I couldn't get to it. And it was from Adele Chalifu, who has been on the show a few times. And she said, Mike, you know, you're not going to believe this. And she had included the link in her direct message saying that Lightfoot had passed. And I just sat there and I didn't cry either. But I did sit there probably for about 45 minutes or an hour before I could move again. And then I brought in my phone and pulled up the YouTube of a painter passing through and sat down next to my wife in the dining room and we listened to it. And so that was my immediate reaction to it. And then I put an announcement out on the podcast. Mike, you got a first here. You got a tear from me. This is the first time I've, you know, shed a tear over Gordon. 
it's taken this long. But sitting here and talking with somebody who is uh, I don't know, so deep into his catalog and deep into his music and deep into everything Lightfoot and being able to commiserate is kind of what's brought it out. Like you were saying, I didn't know how to react at that point, but I was not shocked. Uh, it was not a shock to me because I've seen this happen before. I remember with George Harrison, the family at some point had asked for privacy and then there was uh, radio silence for a while and then he passed away. And that's kind of the same thing that happened with Gordon. So I was kind of prepared. I knew it would happen uh, fairly soon. Yeah. Something inside told me that. Yeah, I think a lot of fans realized when he canceled those tour dates that this was probably the beginning of the end, but none of us wanted to admit it especially the people that I've had on the show, that they were, I think, in some way, denial is probably too strong a word, but they didn't want to come to grips with the fact that this is somebody who was no longer the artist that he had been and was probably ready to go to some degree or another. That's what it sounds like. You know, from everything I've read, it sounded like he was well prepared and uh, he was not somebody who was going to face death in any manner, but what you would expect from Gordon Lightfoot. I don't know what his actual last words were, but one of the things that he said not long before he died was, well, we had a good run, didn't we? And he certainly did. Amen. So, Chris, you had mentioned that you work for a radio station, and you also mentioned that you play music uh, on Saturday nights. Can you say just a little bit more about that in case people want to find you and cheer you on? Sure. I've got a Facebook page called uh, Chris Davis Singer Songwriter. I play here in Jackson, Mississippi. This is my home territory. I just moved back here in January after seven years in Indianapolis working for WIBC Radio, where I was the news director. That's what I do. That's my stock and trade. I'm a radio newsman. I work at a TV station here. It's not my bag. and Mm -hmm. I'm definitely going to be looking to do radio again as soon as I get out of my current situation. We're here because of some family troubles. Uh, But in any case, the music that I play is, I play Beatles, I play James Taylor, I play Cat Stevens, and of course, I play Gordon Lightfoot. I play, uh, you know, 60s and 70s pop, and the people at the pizza place seem to like it, so I'll keep doing it as long as they'll have me. (laughs) Well, Chris Davis, this has been an absolute joy. It's great to converse with someone who has felt Gordon's music as deeply as you have, because of course I have also. So thank you very much for your time. And I'd love to have you on the show again real soon. I'd love to say the same about uh, your passion for Lightfoot's music. And I appreciate the opportunity. And thanks for listening, everybody. If you like this well enough to listen to the whole thing, tell somebody about it. Carefree Highway Revisited is on Apple, Spotify, Acast, or wherever you get your listening matter. Our website is www.lightfootpodcast.com. I'd like to make a special request for you to visit my Patreon page. I love this show so much, and I want to keep it going, and you're in a position to help. Please head over to www.patreon.com slash carefreehighwayrevisited. A dollar or two a month is all I ask. You can reach me, Mike Messner, at teachermike72 at gmail.com. Well, our next episode will feature my guest, Glenn Nelson, from Keller, Texas. He and I will each be discussing our top five covers of Lightfoot songs, and that's scheduled to come out in the early to mid-July of 2023. Until then, for Chris Davis, this is Mike Messner reminding you, run for the roses, but don't forget to stop and smell them. We'll see you next time. 